Yes, just to re reiterate what Chris said, that the hurricane in uh, America uh, last week showed the absolute urgency of addressing this issue. And uh, for that reason, I think it's extremely uh, important this debate we've got to, today. What we're debating today is green growth, is it possible, or um, how can we get it, basically? And I think that's, uh, I'll, basically I'll say yes to both, and green growth is possible, and, uh, but only, only if we have a um, planned, democratically planned society under those, under those conditions. But also, green growth, I'd say, is essential. It's not only possible, but it's essential. It's essential in order to create the conditions where environmental problems are solved. And I think that is the thing I'm going to argue uh, this afternoon. Now, capitalism, I think, is destroying the planet. A lot of people up here, I think, would agree. And the fundamental reason for that, I don't, unfortunately, we've only got 15 minutes. I can only very briefly touch on the points today uh, in the argument. Perhaps we'll bring them out more in the discussion. But capitalism is destroying the planet, I think, primarily because of the competition between the major powers, the major imperialist capitalist powers for profit. And that has prevented them over a period now of over 20 years of reaching any agreement on global warming, which of course is the um, overwhelmingly important uh, issue facing the, uh, the environment. So I think those are the, uh, the reasons for capitalism um, destroying the planet. But it actually goes a little bit beyond that as well. Because I think the existence of competitive markets in a capitalist system actually degrades inevitably degrades the environment, um, whatever, whatever else. And I think Karl Marx actually pointed out in the 19th century, the need of the capitalist system, when it developed a theory for expanding the production of capital, the need for capital uh, to continuously expand in a, in a competitive system. And of course, in that process, the environment actually gets a very low priority because it's a profit-driven system. And I think that is the, uh, what, is, uh, what is behind it. And it's clear, isn't it, that um, when we're talking about growth, or green growth, in this debate, that's impossible under capitalism. It's, it's actually built into the foundations of capitalism that it cannot actually uh, achieve that. But it's a paradox, I think, that technically it's simple, you know, you know, it's not rocket science to replace, you know, power stations that use coal with wind, wave, and solar power. Is 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 perfectly simple. You know, it's, there's no it, the technology exists now. It's proven. It's actually being used at a very small scale. There's nothing to stop us doing that and taking it to the point where energy production is is sustainable. So I think that is. Uh, that is a paradox, isn't it? But, but why isn't it? Why is it actually happening in society? And I think it's, again, it goes back to this question of profit is the uh, thing that is preventing it. And all we need to develop public transport more. We need to develop sustainable housing. All these things can be done, can be done easily. It seems naturally not that expensive. The Labour government had a, a report, a stern report, um, a few years ago which came to the conclusion, yes, we can solve um, the problem of global warming. It would only it would actually involve 1% of economic output per year being devoted to tackling the issue, which it doesn't seem to be uh, too much to us. But even that has proved absolutely impossible on the basis of a profit-driven system. And so I think we need to we need to take that on board, and I think, and that's, I mean, in the Socialist Party we brought out this book recently, Planning for the Planet, which I wrote, which actually makes the case for an alternative social system. 
as a replacement for capitalism. Because I think that's the essential point. To replace capitalism has got to be the starting point of any serious attempt to address environmental problems. And, but of course, when we, as soon as we've said that, so what are you going to replace it with? I'd say we replace it with a democratically planned social society. Now it's easy to say that, and uh, what I've tried to do in the book is to explain in some detail actually how that would operate and how it would function. I can't go into it in the lead off now, there's no time, but maybe we can touch on some of those points in the, in the discussion. But the other thing which, which if, we, if we do that, if we do that, it will then be possible to begin to address the international antagonism between countries that have prevented agreements coming through on climate change. And I think that is, uh, that is a, a crucial issue, a crucial issue, because we've seen over 20 years now innumerable international discussions, UN conferences and so on, which have all failed, completely failed to address this, this question. I think it goes fundamentally to the system itself, why they can't. Can't, can't do that. But let's go beyond that. It's not just a question, let it be a start actually, because to get a real agreement on solving environmental problems, we have to have, we have to actually remove inequalities in society and tensions between nations which have prevented agreement in the first place. And that does mean, I think, um, removing economic inequalities. Now how can we do that? I say again, we have to provide for the, all the inhabitants of the planet a basic <coughs> requirements of life. You know, housing, health, education, decent amount of leisure time, and, and so on. These are not outrageous uh, things to ask for. But of course, for the what, three quarters of the world's population, they are completely beyond reach at the moment. But in a, in a future society, it wouldn't be possible to get agreements on issues like global warming if these inequalities persist. So I think we have to address those questions. And I say we can do that on the basis of, and that will require growth, of course, to meet you know, the, you know, the four or five billion people on the planet who at the moment live on a subsistence level will require growth. And I think you might say, well, God, you know, we can't do that. But what's happening in China? You know, China is now single-handedly uh, sort of destroying the planet in terms of its uh, its pollution. So how on earth can we expand that to the rest of the world's population? Well, I said only on one condition that we actually have democratic planning and production internationally. That is a, the basis for a future way forward. And if we do that, we can introduce like China instead of opening one new coal-fired power station every week, would develop renewable energy, which it actually started to do, although it's on a very small scale at the moment, and that is now in trouble. But if that is entirely possible to uh, to do that, and I think that is, but only, of course, only on the basis of a planned, democratically planned uh, society, which must be, must be non-capitalist. Now, I think, I haven't got too much time, but if we quickly look at some of the objections, the first objection will which uh, many Greens always raise, of course, is that if we're talking about the amount of growth required to meet the needs of the entire population of the world, to give them a basic and decent standard of living, it would go beyond the ability of the planet to sustain this sort of, uh, this sort of consumption. And we will you know, basically just accelerate. We've got enough problems now with global warming, but of course, if you imagine, um, Places like China, India, and so on, all uh, expanding and growing, probably would be worse. Now, I would say, we just said that, that is, we're not proposing to do that. I mean, China is not a model of development. China is a model of, uh, of, of how to actually destroy the, the planet in terms of its environmental impact. Therefore, you know, that is, but that, of course, is because China has, has grown on a capitalist basis. China has entirely been driven, the growth in China, well it's complicated actually, but to a significant extent anyway, growth has been driven in China by a profit system. And it's inevitable, as I said at the beginning, that environmental issues will be pushed to the bottom of the agenda in that, on that basis. 
So we, we certainly wouldn't propose that. You have to look at a fundamentally different way of organising society if you're going to solve these, solve these issues. Now the other uh, big question, of course, is, well, planning doesn't work. The alternative social system you're proposing doesn't work, as shown by the Soviet Union. And, and the Soviet Union obviously ultimately collapsed because its economy uh, didn't, didn't function properly. But it was also an environmental disaster as, as well. And so I think the, um, that is, that is actually probably the main objection that people would face. And again, we don't have time today in, in the lead up to really go into the details of this, but we would say that you know, the Soviet Union was not a model of socialist development. The Soviet Union was a uh, degenerated into a uh, dictatorship, into a one-party authoritarian regime. Which is true, it wasn't based on capitalism, but it certainly wasn't based on any democratic functioning order of society. And that is really the crucial question. <coughs> I think the, you need two things. I think to have a, a, a viable alternative social system, you need two things. You need a, a plan of the economy. You need to take it out of the hands of the capitalists and out of the hands of a profit-driven system. But you need to have as well a democratically organized uh, method of or a running society. And that is possible. You know, we can build institutions to, um, to run society in such a way. In the very first years of the Soviet Union, they existed, but they were, they were overtaken by the developing dictatorship led by, led by Stalin. But that is not inevitable. First of all, I think it's the conditions in which um, the Soviet Union was born were totally, uh, were incredibly difficult as it was, as it, you know, it was born in the middle of the First World War and the terrible conditions that they, they faced there. They were ravaged by the war itself, by a civil war launched against them by all the capitalist countries. And the society was, was um, reduced to cannibalism actually at one point. It was at that level. And it's highly unlikely any future society, any future social society would actually face those problems. On the contrary, we would actually use all the latest developments of capitalism, particular things like the internet. I think the internet, well, it's not a technical fix, but it would make the um, planning far, far simpler, far, far more, more effective than it was in the Soviet Union by being able to use these modern uh, techniques where we can get a genuine uh, feedback from, from consumers in society, from, from workers in society. In, the, in terms of what they require and uh, how society should be organised. And that's, uh, that's a, a, critical, a critical issue. So I'll, uh, that, that's, a, that's the basic ideas that I want to put forward today. Perhaps we can develop them more in the, in the, uh, in the discussion. But I also think, just to finish on this, I don't know what, uh, I don't know what clients can say, but uh, just take up some of the points that are sometimes raised about the Belgians by the, uh, by the Greens, by the Green Party. Particularly they have a, an idea which they call contracts and converge, where they're saying that you can, you can fix these international issues of development, sort of poverty on the world scale, by the leading, by the industrialised countries really converging, uh, sorry, contracting their uh, actions, contracting their consumption and the poorer countries um, increasing, converging towards a, sort of a sustainable world. And I'd say that is uh, just, uh, the, first of all, the figures don't add up on that, I don't think. You would have to, in order to um, come anywhere near to achieving a sustainable balance on that, you have to go back to a pre-industrial society in the, in the West, in the advanced capitalist countries. Which I think is, well, for us it's hard to see how it would actually come back. Is it desirable? I don't know. And it wouldn't be. And also, if you did go back to that very low level society, all the antagonisms of course, problems in global warming, and reaching agreements on global warming, would, would occur again and would actually be amplified in all the So I think that's. And on the other side, I mean, 
in terms of the expansion of, of, of poor countries to solve uh, to to promote development. But I mean, it's a rather interesting one when you're talking about contracting countries. Do we include China as a as a contracting or a converging country? And because uh, China is poor, China is not even yet a medium income country. China is a poor per country in terms of per capita incomes, but they're now by far the biggest environmental footprint of any country in, in the world. And you know, they will, I think the projection now is within 10 years, China will account for 80% of greenhouse gas emissions on the world scale, which is quite incredible. So well, where does China fit from this? On the, uh, of course I would say, well, on the basis of capitalism, it doesn't fit in at all. I mean, it uh, it's clearly has to cut absolutely dramatically its greenhouse gas output in China, which is causing global warming. But that is just not going to happen if they continue on their capitalist profit-driven uh, growth model. And therefore they have to move to a different system, a social system, and that, such as the one that I've tried to very, very briefly today outline. There's some of, some of the questions anyway, which are, are raised by Green sometimes in terms of development and, and justice, international justice and fairness, and I think there are big, uh, big problems with them. So I'll, I'll stop there, I've had my, my time, but I'm sure people can take up more of these issues in the discussion, which I hope will be very uh, successful. Thanks, Peter. Okay, I'm now into the next slide. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, what I'm going to start with is the uh, it's absolutely important that you all see this uh, this, this graph. Ah, now then, I don't have to. The trouble is, I can't. What I've, what I would, what I've done originally was get this so it was full screen and everybody could see it. Because I'm going to just leave that there until the page. And there'll come a point in the in, in my talk where I'm going to go on to that. Right. Right. Well, let's say I'm, uh, just very briefly. Um, there's only a couple of things that I would query about uh, about what Peter said. One is uh, our attitude to development. I won't go into details, but uh, and also uh, I have a personal problem with uh, contracting conversion as it was originally set out, and uh, but I'm not quite sure what what the Green Party's official policy is on either of those. Anyway, I am not here as a member of the Green Party, even though I was almost a founder member. Uh, I joined when it was a response to the Limits to Growth study, which said that if we go on as we are now with, with an expanding economy, you know, with perpetual economic growth, uh, then the world is somewhat bound to come to a, 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 a juddering halt at some point. They thought 1995. We are, okay, there were recessions which t delayed the timescale, but the thing is we are still running into environmental problems. Now, it dawned on me at a very early stage that two things were absolutely essential to each other. One was, we've got to save the planet, and if you like, from capitalism, although although capitalism is a problem, to me it's a symptom of a deeper illness, which, uh, which has destroyed the societies which didn't have capitalism. It's a, the, the, as long as you've got a growth culture, sooner or later you run into problems. Capitalism is simply a very, um, well, it's efficient in patches, at doing what it was intended to do, and that was to foster growth for whoever was winning all the competition. And, and I couldn't agree with Peter, more with Peter about, about competition being, being uh, you know, an important part of the problem. The other thing was, it obviously there is a need for a degree of social justice if we are going to save the planet. Now, we, I have my own ideas on what, what I mean by social justice, which might differ in some ways from yours, but. Certainly, there has to be more social justice than there is in, in the world at the, at, at the moment. Now, my personal answer to this, you've got to remember, I am assuming, unlike Peter, that we have there will be patches when we must be able to do without growth. There are lots of so-called primitive tribes which did have, um, a lot, uh, 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 they perceived themselves as wealthy. They had resources to spare over and above what they saw and what their basic needs they lived in, in harmony with their environments for we don't know how many countless millennia. Um, you know, so if our technological society can't do that, we've got something wrong that they've got right. And 
looking at these societies, what I found was that, uh, and this is from uh, uh, Richard Wilkinson, who wrote the book in 1972, long before he, uh, he met Kate Pickett, um, called Poverty in Progress. And he identifies some of these primitive tribes as having the strategy of sharing basic needs as a right, and then you can have whatever rules you want for everything else. Now, that's not quite socialism, but I'm suggesting that at least that is consistent with a steady state economy. Now, there may be growth may be possible, but we've got to look at a steady state economy as something that we might have to have for possible short periods, possible long periods, there might be growth from time to time, that's the main thing. Um, so, the answer to this, the way to adopt to um, institute what so-called primitive types of law in our society, I see as the citizen's income. Now, this will sound quite crazy. If you come into this idea of coal, you will start by thinking this is farming, and obviously I've got another ten minutes to try and persuade you that it's, <laughs> not only is it sensible, it's absolutely essential. It's the principle that everybody gets a sum of money to cover you as for basic needs as defined in our society. Now, I can't go into details, but up to 1979, the long-term supplementary benefit, when everybody asks, well, what figure are you talking about? And, well, long-term supplementary benefits, well, of course, the perhaps you couldn't see, you know, did away with all that. So I can't give you a precise figure nowadays. It's probably about £140 for every individual, if I must produce figures, but, uh, but I'll come to that in late, later. Now, I have an impossible task because part of my original vision when I would join this group that was to say, we've got to save the planet, how are we going to do it? And I was one that put the new budget. I saw a vision, which I've still got, that we can get socialists, former socialists, still socialists, and some people who still think of themselves as conservatives, actually cooperating. Presumably, Zach Goldsmith's name is Mud in this room. Um, I hope to tell you that he has got to understand that, that you guys are right in a lot that you say, and Peter's right in what he says. You guys have got to listen to him, that once he's taken on board your ideas, there's some ideas that he says that I think will be necessary for a sustainable society, a, a zero growth country. But anyway, that, that's, you know, I, I've just got to put that marker down because all I'm going to do for the rest of my time is explain. Has it gone? Uh, can we can we get it back in somewhere? What that now? Oh dear, what's happening now? Oh, oh, there we are. Right. Now that, as I said, just just to make sure I didn't look up again, is a graph of. Now this is actually from dynamic benefits which was a report produced by a, a think tank set up by Ian Duncan Smith when he was still in opposition. This would, if you wanted to Google this, I was hoping to put up the link, but, but uh, I'm afraid I don't go, I don't want to lose this. So I don't, I don't quite know how to manage it. We can possibly sort that out later. But if you, if you Google Centre for Social Justice, this was published in 2009. It doesn't come up immediately, but I have, I have you know, I've downloaded this within the last fortnight, so it's still there. Now, that actually shows the withdrawal of benefits as, as though they were taxes. You could introduce a citizen's income straight away, but as a transitional measure, you put everybody back exactly where they are now by, by giving everybody £140 a week or whatever it comes to, £110 a week. I don't know what the precise figure would be. You give every adult, every single adult that, that, that amount. Uh, and you get it if you couple, so it doesn't matter. But to put people back where they are now, you would have to have a tax structure like that. Now, you just imagine, suppose you're on £15,000 a year. Right, just look at that, that square. That is the amount of your income that you pay in tax under the present system. If you go to £25,000 a year, no, it's a lot better. If you go up to 100,000 pounds, oh, by the way, this goes up from 30% to 50 or more to 50% or something like that on very high incomes, you're still doing a dump site better than these guys down here, right? Now, all the citizen's income actually does in practical terms is shift this where it belongs. And quite frankly, it would be people like me. I, you know, I was a probation officer on the top rate. If anybody called my bluff on this, I would have been a loser in straightforward financial terms. Now, the thing is, all this talk about scroungers, the thing is, 
it's, 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 this, uh, this report is absolutely incredible. Not only has it got this graph, it uses the phrase, those who avoid entering the labour market are making a rational decision due to the loss of the, what they would lose in benefits. It actually says all this, you see. Now, what I would like is, if you want a rally, I want a rally with people going around with placards with that up and saying, <laughs> it, it, no, I mean, I'm serious, that this is, you know what I mean, I'm an old man in a hurry, you know what I mean? <laughs> but but the, the, the thing is, right, you can forget your green issues, Let's just concentrate on the uh, on why socialists should be taking it seriously. Right, have I got much time left? Have I said it and muted it all yet? No, five minutes. No, five minutes. Right. Well, I mean that that is the, the main thing that I wanted to I wanted to get you know to get across. Um, yeah, I mean, just go away with this philosophical concept. Taxes are sums of money taken from individuals by public bodies. Benefits are sums of money given to individuals by public bodies. Therefore, what is the effect of the withdrawal of a benefit? What is the effect of means testing? And there it is for you. You know, and I've written a book. You can buy it from me at twelve pounds if you want, and it would cost you twenty if you ordered it from the Green Economics Institute plus postage, you know, for it. Or I'm selling these a resume of it for a pound. I just want to cover my costs. So if, you, if anybody wants a copy of this, a pound, please. Or if you come and say your own ways, I'll believe you. Just take it, you know. So, because I want to get, I just want to get the word out. But basically, it it, 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 it it tells it in a bit more detail. Because if I tried to explain it, it wouldn't make sense unless you read the whole thing. But that's the point. The, the, you know, this all this talk about scroungers, 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 scroungers. Once you've got the citizen's income, you can then the, the whole point about it, from my point of view, it could do the exact opposite. <coughs> There was a Tory, a, a, a Tory cabinet minister in 1974 who actually brought out a scheme of citizens, that, uh, uh, well it was called a tax credit scheme, but it was the same thing. But he wasn't going to take any taxes out, and the idea was to have maximum growth. Now I want it for quite the opposite purpose. I want it so that we, don't lo we no longer need to depend on growth. And the point is, this is what it does, it gives everybody security so that everybody can make an individual decision do I need to go for this job? No, that would damage the environment. It, it, you see, it, it's like, it says, you don't have to, nobody has to work at all. But, instead of being worse off when you, when you go to work, you would actually be better off. See, at the moment, there's so many people, if they go to work, they face that tax bill, unless they can get, unless they can suddenly become a, you know, something highly skilled. Um, so, there's anything else I really need to say? Oh yes, the main thing I must uh, tell me if I have to say this time to shut up. Alaska, there are there are actually some, there's a full citizen's income up and running in, of all places, Iran, on, based on the oil revenues. So, they don't need to take it out of taxation, it's easy. See. Now, um, there is, it's actually, it's, in, it's on the statute book in Brazil, but, it's, but they haven't implemented it yet. But Alaska is the most incredible of all. Again, Alaska has a permanent dividend fund based on oil revenue. So again, it's, it's painless. They don't need to take it from anybody in tax. But, and this is another thing I would think I was going to put up, which uh, I really haven't time to do. If you, um, if you Google the, I don't know if you've heard of the Gini Index, G-I-N-I, -I, it was an Italian who invented it. It's, it measures levels of inequality in different states and so on. If naught would be complete, everybody had exactly the same income. Um, one would be one of that one individual having it all and everybody else having nothing. Now, um, Brazil's hovering around five. The United States is just below five, it's 4.5 or something like that. You'd never guess which is the second most egalitarian state um, in, in, uh, in America. If I hadn't already told you, it's Alaska. And they have this permanent dividend fund. The last place you'd expect it, you know, the home of the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. you, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? They, they really don't know, realise that they're, they're introducing the, my ideas on social justice. It might not satisfy you guys, but, uh, you, you know, as I said, I think. Um, yeah, the, the, the only other thing that I don't want to leave if I'm, I'm still allowed to, 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 to say is I have to, I, I'm very shaky, I'm a very old man, I'm very shaky on these modern things, Twitter, 
Facebook, you, you name it. But with a lot of help, I have actually managed to start a blog, which goes into, into all this. The name, uh, the blog is you know, www. You know that, and then it's Clive Lord with no space. You know, it's just a C L I V E L O R D dot WordPress dot com. And you can, as I say, and uh, you can say, but there are ideas. You'll see, you'll already see their ideas there. And you'll think, oh, I don't agree with this. But I'm asking you to think about it. I'm doing it weekly, each Friday. There'll be one next Friday, and then on the 16th, I am going to write an open letter to Zach Goldson. I'm going to say, this one, this is the, 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 the blog this week is why socialists should, should take, the, the, take up the citizens' income seriously. In a fortnight, it'll be why he should take up the citizens' income. Because I don't think he agrees, he doesn't actually agree with the citizens' income, but he does have green credentials. You know what I mean? Okay. Thank you.